you can hear me well. Okay. So hello everybody. So today we have the pleasure to host Ansgar Reiners for the IAP seminar. Unfortunately, a remote seminar, not live in Paris. So hopefully soon we'll be back in Paris. So Ansgar is professor at Institute for Astrophysics in Göttingen, Germany, where he was uh, acting director up to recently. He's in Göttingen for about 15 years uh, now before he worked in uh, Hamburg, in Berkeley. He did his studies in Uppsala, Sweden, then in Heidelberg and Hamburg in Germany. Ansgar is a specialist of uh, spectroscopic analysis of stars. So he studies stellar rotation, stellar activity, stellar magnetism. He does that, he observes, he, 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 he works on uh, Loma star, M dwarfs, brown dwarfs, and extrasolar planets. Ansgar is a science PI of, Germ of the German parts of the Kermanes Consortium. So Kermanes is a spectrograph working in uh, optical and infrared uh, germ, uh, a project from Germany and Spain at the uh, Caralto Observatory in, uh, in Spain. So we will talk today about that. So I let you the floor, Ansgar, on Kermanes, please. Thank you very much. I will share my screen. It's a pleasure to be here and to be able to talk about Carmenes, about M dwarfs planets and their atmospheres, and the results from, from now five years of Carmenes. Of course, it would have been nice to be in Paris, and I, I guess I don't have to complain for too long. I hope to come and discuss these things with you in person. I have to reorganize a few things here for the before I can really start. Okay, now I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm good. Um, I would, before I start, I would like to um, clarify and, and point out that I would be very happy to answer questions during the talk. Also, if you put them in the chat, um, I hope to, to monitor this as well. So if you have questions, don't be shy. Um, I, I experience that these Zoom talks can sometimes can be a little bit um, strange. And uh, I, I would rather like to talk about things that you're really interested in if, if we come up to something and where you have a question. And then I, I may be able to skip one or the other part. So what I did here for the talk is to collect different uh, science results that came out of Carmenes and to give you an overview of the project. And then of course, um, go into some details about M dwarfs, um, planets, and of course their atmospheres, which is mainly what we do. I'll start with this picture just to get us, to get us set. Um, the quest for terrestrial habitable, if you want, uh, planets around stars very nearby is one of the big goals uh, that we all have and that, that we have in astronomy, uh, at least in this, uh, in this field. And this paper um, reported uh, years ago, uh, not from Carmenes, but from, from other work, uh, and mainly from Harps data and, and other instruments, the discovery of Proxima and B, the closest planet to, the, uh, to, to, uh, to, this, uh, to, to us uh, in, in, around another star. And if we look around, to, uh, into, our, into the neighborhood, into our solar neighborhood, we see a couple of uh, stars. We see Proxima Centauri here. This is where, where this planet was found. Here, this is Proxen, and then there's Arthasen A and B. There's Barnard star. This is the, the, the next closest planet, and there, and there are in different direction other, other stars. And um, of course, these stars are so far away that going there and going for some, for some vacation on these planets is not immediately possible. But of course, it's interesting to find out what kind of things they are, right? Whether they have planets and, of and also them being so close means that they are very, very, um, I mean, more easily being studied than, than uh, remote planets, of course. Everything gets easier if things are close. I don't think I, I need to um, talk about this in any more detail. And then if you think about what is out there, what kind of planets are there? Um, for example, from this histogram from, from the Recon survey, from the 10 parsec survey, uh, we know that about 70 to 80 percent of all the stars, at least in the local galaxy, are M dwarfs. Uh, and M dwarf, by the, by the way, um, is this historical spectral class definition is, is not very it's not a very good one, I personally feel, but okay, uh, we end up with this kind of class of objects, which really covers a lot. It covers a factor of a few, a factor of five almost in mass, almost six in mass. Um, and there's really, really many stars in there. And as you can see, most of our local neighbors in the, in the local galaxy, they are M dwarfs. So um, here's, here's one answer to the question why we want to investigate them. 
And then the other answer, of course, is that we are doing radial velocities, we're doing spectroscopy, and we are working together uh, with transit photometry and other uh, instrumentation to study planets the best we can. And if you do this in M dwarfs, a lot of things are actually easier than um, if you do this in other stars. Some things become also more complicated, but let's not talk about this now. What is easier is that the M dwarfs are lighter. They're not as heavy, not as massive as the other stars, which means that you have orbital motion, you have a planet orbiting that star, the reflex motion, the dance that the star is, is carrying out, is performing is a lot larger and easier to see with all methods, be it astrometry, be it radial velocity, uh, or what, what have you. Um, also, these stars are cooler, which means that the so-called liquid water habitable zone, that's where water, if it existed, could be in liquid form, is closer to the star, which means if you are looking for a planet inside the habitable zone, it is easier to, to detect than if you, for example, look for Earth around the sun, right? Earth around the sun takes a year uh, for a complete orbit. That means that you have to observe for a couple of years these kind of stars to find habitable zone planets. In M dwarfs, this may only be a couple of days or weeks. So um, this is sort of for the motivation. And then from the, from the stellar perspective, M dwarfs are, are super interesting because they are said to be very active. Uh, many people claim and still still say that uh, M dwarfs, all M dwarfs are very active. Um, that I can tell you right right from from the beginning is a lie, and that is mainly because uh, M dwarfs they they cover such a large range in mass. For the experts, there are there are early M dwarfs uh, up to the spectral type of M three and a half, M M four. So these are stars that are still fairly sun-like. They can be very very inactive and and um, just as uh, if you want boring as the other inactive stars, but of course these stars are not boring. They're just pure doing what they are usually doing, not being distracted by, by producing magnetic fields in a very, very heavy way. And then there are these, these fully convective stars uh, that are totally different from, from the stars that, that have, a, have a different uh, inner structure, sun-like structure. Uh, and those stars are really, really active uh, under normal circumstances. And of course, understanding all this, everything that has to, has to deal with this, that goes together with this, is a very interesting astrophysical problem. And that is something that, of course, uh, comes with the investigation of planets around these stars. If you, if you carry out the radial velocity technique, if you're measuring spectra, you can do all the, all the uh, astrophysical uh, stuff that, that, you, that you want to do in, in stars anyhow. And then they are red, right? So these M dwarfs are very red. And that means um, that their spectra, they, they produce a lot of photons or they send out a lot of photons at long wavelengths. So um, for example, if you look for uh, spectroscopic information from sun-like stars, you do this typically at around four or 500 nanometers uh, because this is where you get a lot of flux and a lot of information from sun-like stars. Here, the red curve, for example, shows more uh, in contrast to the other stars what an M dwarf does. And you can see that between 300, 400, 500 nanometers, there's not that much flux coming. The details depend a lot on how you look at it. And, um, uh, but but the, the, the point is that M dwarfs are so red that you really want to go to red wavelengths, right? So you don't want to do this with a typical HARPS instrument that peaks at, a lot, uh, at about four, 500 nanometers and, and uh, barely goes up to 650. Uh, you want to do this at longer wavelengths, which is why you need a different instrument than, than what has been um, there before commoners and some other instruments. Um, and this is just a reminder of the activity thing. So this, this shows you what I just said before, that stars before spectrotype M3 or so are not actually very active. This is a fraction of stars that show H alpha in emission. H alpha is a very interesting, uh, very useful um, indicator of chromospheric activity. If you see it in emission, it means that the star is producing some kind of strong activity. Uh, and we see that the stars of spectral type M4, M5, about 60, 70% of them are producing this H alpha emission. Uh, stars before that, uh, M0, M1, M2, are only, the, only a few percent are producing H alpha emission. So, so these are the physical aspects that we're trying to study. Now, um, let's set the stage. Uh, this is a plot that, that uh, you very well know, uh, maybe not in these, these kind of unusual uh, colors, 
but I've been trying to to highlight the different methods here and uh, with all the different lines and stuff. We we won't go through all of it. If you are if you feel uh, offended or a little bit uh, overwhelmed by this, um, we only need a few uh, information from here, and we come back to this plot later. So you you see stellar mass for every planet found. You see the mass of the star around which the planet has been found as a function of its distance. And in different colors, so for example, the blue circles, those are planets that have been found with the radial velocity method. And um, the masses of the planets are not coded here. They are actually encoded in the size of the signals. So most, all the, all the planets, for example, that have been found, um, or most of the planets are actually uh, a lot more massive than, than what we uh, know from the solar system. And then there's this, this cloud of transiting planets, these uh, green triangles that are very close to the star, um, even at higher masses. Most of those come from the Kepler mission. So um, this has been a mission dedicated to find these planets. And we, we see that they exist. There are a lot of these planets, OK? And then if we go down, if we go to lower stellar masses, uh, which is here, so there's not that much information. Of course, there is information. And this is, this is a plot from before Carmenis started. Or, or, or uh, without the Carmenis discoveries. I'll show you the Carmenis discoveries later. So we set out to investigate this area here to see where, uh, whether how, how this uh, the parameter space here is filled with planets. Um, you can see Trappist one down here. So this was the transit detection, and you you can see another you know, uh, familiar familiar planets um, in this plots in this plot as well. You can also see that microlensing is producing planets down here at larger distances to the star, about one AU. That's sort of the sweet spot for microlensing. Um, but there's no radial velocity detections, uh, not that many radial velocity detections here. And for example, um, Gaia will, will be able to probe this for, um, for very massive planets. Then there's the habitable zone here, what we, what we discussed before. And um, this will all become important uh, later. Of course, Earth here is just in the inner edge of the habitable zone around the sun. OK, so that, that is sort of the situation. Um, or it would be the situation if Carmenis was not there. But uh, in 2010 or so, 10 years ago, 29, I think, uh, this, this team of crazy people gathered together and uh, had the idea of uh, building an instrument, a spectrograph, or a suite of spectrographs to look for planets around red stars and to investigate these red stars. There was an opportunity coming up at Palo Alto Observatory to install a new instrument and to do, do a large survey of something, because there was some, some funding uh, being available. And a Spanish-German team gathered together uh, of these institutes and uh, set out to design the instrument, to build the instrument, and then carry out the science. And um, what we build in hardware is shown here. So you see uh, to the lower right the two instruments, the two vacuum vessels uh, on the left, the left part here, the VIS channel. This is one, there's one spectrograph inside. Uh, this is the size of a minivan, sort of in color alto in a, in a room, temperature controlled room here and the near infrared channel. It's a copy of, of the VIS, so, so the two are, are very similar, but of course set out for different wavelengths operating at different temperatures uh, and with some, some other detailed differences. So we have two different instruments, VIS and near spectrograph. They are both operating at very high spectral resolution. The VIS is almost at 100,000, the near is at 80,000. And on the left-hand side, you see the spectral format. The VIS channel is producing these 55 orders and covering 0 0.55, 0 0.52 to almost a micron. And then the near infrared comes on top and, and adds from one micron sort of up to 1.7 micron. And at the time when we did this, when we, when we built this, one of, one of my main interests was to check where is actually the sweet spot for radial velocity investigation of M dwarfs. At that time, we, we did have some spectra, uh, for example, at, in the infrared, for example, from the old Cryris, there were, the, was this Cryris pop program where we got some high, resol high resolution spectroscopy from M dwarfs. But in general, the field was, the, the, the situation was such that we did not really know what's going on in the infrared um, in, in these M dwarfs. So there were claims that you need to go to like really long wavelengths uh, in order to see anything. 
Um, and some said, okay, no, it's not worth it, and, and back and forth. So um, we had the, the luxury of actually um, covering the entire wavelength range and uh, trying to find out where where is the sweet the sweet spot for which kind of temperatures where to go. It was pretty clear from the beginning that if you go, for example, to really late M's, M7, M8, M9, or even later L dwarfs, uh, you you certainly need to go to really red to to near infrared and and then visual or even red visual 800 nanometers would not be that much uh, much of a gain. But for the intermediate M0 to M7 or so, that was sort of an open question. This is the way uh, how we <clears throat> how we uh, ensure radial velocity stability. We are permanently tracking the wavelengths with fabry perot interferometers. Um, this is this is a technique that has been established um, before uh, Carmen S, but we were among the first instruments, I would say, that uh, on a on a continuous basis used this strategy to to uh, to nightly track the uh, spectral format also because we needed to and we still need to so this is this is sort of uh, one one side note that i make um, that the instrument is uh, is not on an absolute basis stable enough uh, to a meter per second so everyone who's involved in high resolution high precision radio velocity work and instrumentation knows that stabilizing an instrument to the order of a meter per second um, is a huge issue is a huge um, effort and with these fabry perot interferometers that are producing next to the science spectrum, this is, this, this is the science spectrum. We have an image slicer in our optical path. That means every spectrum is sliced into two paths, two spectra. So this is the science spectrum here, one order. And then next to it, we have an order where we shine light from the fabry perot to this. And we, we, fairly, we, we know where these lines are. Um, and public perots have their, their own issues. So you do not really exactly absolutely know where these lines are, but you can, you can track this with, with hollow cathode lamps or other tricks. And this is, um, we, we do this continuously during the night together with the stellar observations. And we get a very good idea on what's happening with the instrument during observations. And this is how we reach uh, a precision of about a meter per second with this instrument. The etalons, I, I want to make the side note, these etalons have been built here uh, in Göttingen in our institute. Uh, this is what we are, what we are uh, sort of, what we have specialized in. Mainly this, this uh, the funding and the, and the uh, research of this came from an ERC grant that I had at this time. And uh, since then, we have also been building etalons for Cryris Plus, uh, one for Theos, and we are in charge of the calibration unit for ELT HIRIS, the high resolution spectrograph for the ELT. So um, this, this calibration thing, this, these calibration strategies are, are very, um, very much of in, in the core of our research here in, in our group. All right, so um, this is a little movie of Kala Alto's 3.6 meter telescope uh, when, it, when it works. Uh, we've been visiting this with a, little, with a little TV team. They produced this nice movie. Um, since 2016, we've been using our science time to investigate M stars. And we have uh, negotiated a guaranteed time of 750 nights, which um, you may guess is an, is an enormous amount of, amount of time, an enormous investment into a science project. And of course, uh, we've, this, is, this is why we are able to uh, do so many things with this. And uh, of course, it needs a lot of scientific coordination. This, this is also true. So you need a lot of people to work on the science. Um, and uh, it has been a lot of fun to work with all these people over the years. We just used up those 750 nights, and I should say that these are 750 good nights. So this is not, there's no weather loss. So this, these, good, these 750 nights were only counted uh, when the telescope actually was open and collecting photons, which, which makes this an even larger chunk of time. So um, at the end of last year, we used up the time and uh, there was an extension. We received another 300 nights for our legacy program where we continue our science, added a few other science cases and um, where we are happily continuing with our, uh, with our team. The political situation changed a little bit meanwhile, so we had to readjust things, but I, I suppose to the outside world and to um, even to us, this, this does not really have huge, a huge impact. We made the decision 
that we are happy with the team that we, we work together quite nicely. It was very successful, as you will see in the, on the next slides. And uh, we, we just uh, continue working like this, but on a reduced uh, amount of time. We do not observe as often anymore as we did so far. Now, here's, here's sort of uh, on one slide, um, the main GTO information. The main program is a survey, spectroscopic survey in just over 300 M stars. So we are continuously observing 300 M stars. We have taken so far then more than 19,000 spectra in both spectrographs. And um, a couple, few years ago, three years ago, we, we uh, published our first sort of survey where we revealed the target stars and we said what we we're doing. And uh, we show the plot on the left-hand side that um, that gives you an impression of the spectral format. So uh, ignore on this on this side here. Ignore the spectral the the, uh, the spectral energy distribution's shape in general. So this is a high resolution spectrograph. It's very difficult to get a to get a clean upper shape. We we could tweak this, but we we didn't want that. But you can see. So the blue is the vis channel, and the red is the near infrared channel. And you can see here at the zoom in at what high resolution we are taking this. And my main point here. Um, and this, this is something that I really want to stress, is the difference between uh, the spectral appearance of an M dwarf at very red and not so red wavelengths. So if you look here on the right hand side, you see the potassium line and you see there, there's a line, right? This is a spectral line embedded in something that you could think is a continuum that is of course uh, impacted still by water absorption from the atmosphere and maybe some molecular absorption from the star who knows what. So this, this is actually data here. There's something going on, but you can you can make out the continuum. On the left hand side, what you see here is not noise. This is data as well, right? So this is what the star is doing. This is all in this case, it's probably TiO or VO, I, I don't know, titanium oxide, vanadium oxide, some molecule that is producing a lot of, of information here, a lot of scatter in the data. And um, so there's this not really a chance to do individual line spectroscopy here. But the amount of information that you get here to determine your radial velocity, so your shift, whether the whole forest shifts to the right or the left, that is, that is enormous. So you do not need too high a signal to noise ratio in this kind of spectral range to carry out a decent radial velocity determination. If you only have one line like here, you need, a, you need more photons in that one line. That, that is one important thing that, that one needs to, to know about. Um, and as soon as you are here at a decent flux range somewhere and you have this kind of pattern, uh, it's fairly, it's, uh, th there's a lot of information, that's my point. There's a lot of information in these stars, particularly here in this wavelength range. And uh, in, that spec in that paper in 2018, we actually published one spectrum for each star. And this, is, this has become uh, useful for a couple of people who were investigating this. Only one spectrum for each star, just to, to make the case and uh, on all the other spectrum spectra we've been working uh, ever since. Here's uh, one of our first demonstration papers, uh, demonstration uh, plots. So you can see radial velocity curves of three stars that have planets that were known before we started the survey. Uh, we injected them into our survey to make sure that we can actually find planets. Um, and uh, the red Symbols here are Carmenis data, and then we have also Hyris and Harps data, and they are folded to the periodicities that are known according to the orbiting planets. And you can see how, how nicely they fit in. You can also compare the, the uncertainties of the data points, and um, you see that this is comparable to Harps and Hyris in these cases, and um, that this, this experiment works well. That's the point here. There's some, some precursor science sort of so the very easy cases, spectroscopic double, double line spectroscopic binaries were one thing that we investigated. We found new nine uh, new double line spectroscopic binaries in our sample of 300 stars uh, determined their properties. And um, that, that is sort of a straightforward exercise, but very interesting, of course, to discover these objects. Okay, let's, let's right get to the, to the to the most exciting, or to the to 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 the to what Carmenis has been built for uh, discoveries of new planets, and um, there's I'm, I'm very happy 
that I can share with you something that um, actually I can announce now and today. So there's a science, a science paper that was coming out today and um, it very nicely came together with, with the talk here uh, in Paris today. So um, Gliese 486b um, is our top candidate now since today uh, for atmospheric investigation of a super earth atmosphere. It is a uh, transiting rocky planet eight parsecs away. It's a discovery that has been made actually by Carmenes. So we, we found the planet first. We had the planet in our RV data. And then, uh, of course, tests came online. And uh, since, ever since TESS uh, was producing data, we've been looking into the data from the stars that we have been surveying with, with our instrument, right? Of course, this, this would be so actually from from the beginning, we, we um, to, uh, to uh, convince our funding agencies and everyone, we produced numbers of how many planets would we find? What would, we, what would be the success rate of our instrument? And we came up with the, with, the, uh, with the estimate that if it works well, there may be one transiting planet that we find with the radial velocities in our, in our survey. So you have 300 M stars, you can, you can work out the probabilities that you have planets around them and then work out the probability that it transits. And you end up with a number of one if you're really lucky two, or I mean, this is close to zero, maybe no. Here's the one that we found. This was sort of predicted or hoped to exist. Uh, we found this, we, we saw the radial velocity signal before TESS discovered it. And when TESS uh, produced the light curves, of course, people jumped on it. And we were, we were very lucky that we already had the data in place. And then we collaborated with our colleagues from Maroon X. And you can see that Maroon X, it's Gemini, it's an eight meter telescope. So uh, of course the data quality is superior to what Carmenis can produce. Uh, but with Maroon X, you are not carrying out this kind of a survey. So uh, we followed it up with Maroon X and we very nicely determined uh, the presence of this planet. And the planet is um, a top candidate, as I say, for atmospheric investigation. And why that is, um, I'll show you in a second. But before that, I show you that um, it is here in the radius mass diagram, you can see its position, Gliese 486b, the red dot on the right-hand side. So it is Earth-like in composition, given its mass and radius, it, it just lies on the pretty much same composition line, uh, the, the same similar density that um, Earth has, or similar composition than Earth has, um, but it is it has a much higher gravity. So there's a, well, whatever high probability, maybe, maybe up to everyone else's, uh, everyone else's understanding of, of the situation and, and to our belief in different models, uh, but because of the higher gravity, there's some chance that the atmosphere, that in atmosphere, if it ever existed, is is being kept on the on the planetary surface, and this can be this can be looked after now um, very intensively. So um, on this slide, I'm showing you all the planetary discoveries that we've made until today, and on the left hand side, you see in the the red stars are the discoveries in this. Uh, mass distance diagram that I've introduced before. So you see all the red stars here. These are Carmenis discoveries, and this is Gliese 486b here. And uh, of course, you see also planets that are orbiting stars that are as heavy as the sun. These are um, test follow ups. So we also jumped on test follow up, of course, when tests reported a transiting planet. Uh, and we had the opportunity, but we also got some data. But you can see that we are populating or we are helping to populate. This, this mass range here. Uh, and Gliese 406b down here, uh, the, the main point here, or one big point is that the period is 1.5 days. That means the transit is, the planet is transiting so often that observing it with either ground-based or space-based instrumentation is, is much easier than in many of the other objects. If you look through this list, for example, this list or any other list of transiting planets, you'll see that most of them have longer periods. Here's one at three days and then, okay, nine, 10, 13. So that means if you wanna do transit follow-up for those, you, you need one of these rare chances that the planet is actually transiting. Gliese 486b is transiting very, very often. Uh, it is very close, eight parsecs. Um, it is visible, observable from both hemispheres. Its um, declination is plus nine. So that makes it a very, very interesting target 
for a spectroscopic follow-up of a super Earth. Um, that that is that is an important information as well. So of course it may be that this planet has no atmosphere at all, but that of course would be very interesting as well. Okay, so this this is the the latest discovery that just came out today, and uh, I will want to show you three more cases that I'll that I'll show here a little in a little bit more detail, but not too much, um, and the others I'll I'll just ignore for the day. Um, just as an in information that I that I missed, so all the all the bold-faced planets here, these these ones, everything that is in bold face, these are transiting planets. Okay, these these have been either follow-up of of mainly test targets or Kepler the K2 targets, or in the case of Lisa 406, we we knew that it's there, and then tests produced the data, and that of course made, made it a lot more interesting. On to yeah, may I in uh, yeah. interrupt you? Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, you for the new planet discovered. Uh, you mentioned in the title of the paper that it could be a very favorable target for atmospheric research. You don't mention much about it. So, could you comment? And in particular, I'm interested to uh, a comparison with Trappist One. Uh, how does it compare to Trappist One as a favorable target for atmospheric research? Yeah, the, 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 it, what is favorable about it is that it's, of course, it's very close and very bright. So it's, of course, it's a lot brighter than, than TRAPPIST-1. Um, it has a very short, uh, very short period. Of course, the tra TRAPPIST planets also have short periods, but the main, the main advantage is that it is so bright and that the signal, so um, I don't have the plots here. There's, there are emission and transmission um, sort of, um, what is it? parameters or, or quality estimators, right? And you can sort of say the, the star needs to be bright and the star, uh, the planet, uh, the planet needs to be large and the, the planet to star ratio. And these kind of things need to be favorable in order to get a signal from the planet that you can collect with a high signal to noise, right? That you can easily measure. And in this kind of, in this kind of comparison, it is very, uh, Lisa 406 is sort of a uh, top list, right? Because it's so close, because it's comparably bright, the star in, in particular in contrast to TRAPPIST-1, uh, mm -hmm. and it also transits very often. Uh, excuse me, uh, could you actually give the magnitudes and the radius sizes? Of the, the magnitude of the star? Of the star, yes. Uh, I don't have that. It's, a, it's an M3, it's very close. So it's one of the brighter, it's one of the very bright M stars. So say it's a K of six, K of eight. Yeah, sort of that. I, I don't have it right here. Maybe it, uh, no, I, I have to look it up, but we, we can easily find that. I'm sure somebody is already on it. Um, and the, the, the mass and radius, so the, the mass and radius of the planet, they are here. At least the mass is 2.8 and the, the radius is 1.7 or something. I don't know. Have to check it. Because if it's 1.7 for 2.8 uh, Earth mass, uh, then it could be also uh, overlapping a bit with the tail of the mini Neptune size. So if you would have told me it is a 1.2, 1.3. Yeah, I suppose it's 1.3. Im yes. Immediate, immediately I would say, oh yes, it looks very interesting on the. Um, we I think we have it on the neck on another slide. It comes. I'll, I'll, we'll, know, we'll see the radius. It's probably 1.3, but um, I have to look it up. Too many planets. Is it on here? No, it's not here. It's only the mass. No, but it's the, yeah, okay. I, I, I should not put out more numbers that may be wrong. So uh, let, let's, let's look it up. Okay, I'll, I'll go on uh, for now. Uh, just another question before you move yeah. on. Uh, I see uh, first thing uh, on this, all these discovered planets, uh, a lot of them are from the transit survey. So uh, about, uh, I don't know how, what's the fraction, maybe half is from pure radio velocity. Um, uh, we know that uh, the, uh, the occurrence rating of planets in M dwarfs are uh, higher than solar type stars, uh, but my question is, is this, your survey is presenting a consistent occurrence rate in M dwarfs or 
there are still some issues that's not detecting all of the all the all the planets that could be detected. Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the big one of the big science goals that we have is to produce uh, occurrence rates, and we are actually uh, producing a paper right now from from the data that we have so far. This will not be the final list, but um, the, and we are asking ourselves uh, to to what extent we are complete, and how that compares to others. And uh, so far, we are pretty much confirming what has been what has been said so far. There are a few spectral bins or a few bins in terms of mass uh, mass and radius and also stellar mass and stellar mass uh, where there are some differences but they they are not super significant at this point so yes in principle uh, we are finding as many planets as we have expected and um, i mean you can say that three there are 300 m dwarfs they should almost all have a planet or so uh, you can ask yourself what's the radio velocity um, what's the radio velocity uh, amplitude which would be on the order of a few meters per second. Um, and then the question is, how many of them can we detect? And then how many of them would we detect, right? So these, these are all the questions that you, that you need to factor in. And if you do all that, um, at the end of the day, the, 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 the estimate was that we might find about 30, 20, 30, maybe 40 planets with the, within the survey. And at this point, uh, where we do not have a complete um, data um, so with, with I, should, I should add this, with 60 observations per star, that's sort of the goal that we have. Um, and it looks like we are getting there. Uh, there's still lots of, there's still about 100 stars, I suppose, that only have about 15 or so observations uh, where we, that do not really enter this, uh, the completeness um, discussion here. Uh, but yes, so, so far, it looks like uh, we are not finding big surprises on this front. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, yeah, here's one other example. This is Barnard star B, the second closest planet to Earth. This was a discovery that you, you can see that was also using many, many instruments, um, including CONEST, and then the, the paper came out of uh, the consortium with the help of many others who were involved in the other observations. And you can see that here, the radial velocity semi-amplitude is 1.2 meter per second. So this is really um, very on the edge. But the, the, the period here is 230 days. So this, this is really a spectacularly long period um, to be found with the 1.2 meter per second uh, amplitude. This was, this was very difficult. And of course, most of the information comes here from, from data going way back, um, HARPS uh, and also UVIS and HIRES and other instruments. And then um, this little planet, and this is where we see, so I think, yeah, it's so, I think this is this should be it. So it's even larger. Okay, we need to we need to look at the at the paper, and um, perhaps somebody can or I I could look it up later what the radius is. So it looks like it's a bit larger here. It's about at the two <clears throat> to Earth. No, it's ah, it's not the radius, right? <laughs> I confused myself. This is two point three solar um, Earth masses, but we don't have the radius here. So again, we need to find it. But this slide here now is about uh, another interesting object, um, GJ3512b, and that's this guy here. So this diagram now shows you the planetary mass versus the stellar mass, right? So if you are here, this, this planet here, this is right in the area where you usually only have microlensing discoveries. And these microlensing discoveries, they occur because microlensing has the, uh, has the opportunity to look at really a lot of stars, right? So even if there are only a few planets out there, um, microlensing is very sensitive to these and it finds a few. So there is a population of high mass planets around low mass stars. And now we have uh, we've found the first with the radial velocity method, or we've, we've measured the first with the radial velocity method. This is radial velocities here. So very easy detection if you have the data. And um, it, it, it lies right in there. And this is a, a big trouble for planet formation models. So this planet has not formed through planet accretion. There is some kind of, uh, of uh, gravitational instability formation model that, that needs to be invoked if you want to explain the existence of this planet. Very interesting object for these, for these theories. OK, and then I've, Ansgar, I've Ansgar, yeah. So yeah. Turn to why this planet is more challenging the planet formation models than other planets we discovered with microlensing? 
uh, for it, it, it is not more. It, it is it was very challenging for the microlensing as well. So this is this is not an entirely new uh, thing that that we found, but we, we discovered this close by, and with the radial velocity method. So all the other plots here that you see, all the other points, they are as challenging as well. Um, but of course, the uncertainties and masses and everything that comes with microlensing uh, is sort of a bit a bit more um, remote. Let's put it that way. Than if if you measure measure the mass with the radial velocity technique. Uh, one small Is comment. Wait, wait. As a micro lenser, I can yeah. say because we are doing mass measurements now by revisiting with adaptive optics. So we are getting masses down to 10%. So yeah. what, we, what you say is that for the discovery papers, this is correct. But now we revise the masses down to 10%. And indeed, we have a population of uh, this kind of massive planets on uh, wide orbits uh, orbiting low mass stars. And they are indeed complicated uh, for star formation. I fully agree with you. And it's very good to have one of them discovered with radial velocity. Yeah. Right. And my main my main point is here, here is that that we we made this discovery with RVs, uh, and it it confirms that this uh, that this population exists. Uh, we are very happy that we found one. But of course, this this problem with planet formation was existing before. Anna, did you want to say something more? No, oh, thank you. Okay. Good. Um, right. Yes, and I, I should add that uh, we've actually been thinking about uh, whether we want to focus on this type of objects now and we are, and, and go for it and add another science case. And we've recently been uh, looking into into Gaia, of course. So this is this is what Gaia will do, right? Gaia will wipe out this this entire this entire uh, question probably because they will find lots of planets in this in this range and everything that you could find with radial velocity or most of the planets. Gaia will have found them uh, be probably before we, we can really get started uh, with many more stars. So um, astrometry here uh, is, is a big, is a big uh, help. Then. Okay, and then uh, I have another, I have a video here that I want to show you. And this video shows you the discovery of Tea Garden Star and Tea Garden Star is a very low mass planet. It is a very low mass star. It is this star, um, the lowest mass star for which the radial velocity method has been determining uh, the mass of the planet. So we have this star here with two planets, and these two planets are right in the habitable zone of the star. And uh, that, of course, is quite spectacular by itself and is quite nice. Um, and there's a there's a little fun fact I would want to call it it's scientifically perhaps not too relevant, uh, but at least it, it makes a very nice story. So if if you're living on planet B or planet C or if there's somebody and is looking to the solar system, the star is right in the ecliptic plane. So you can see the solar system planet transiting from Tea Garden Star, which may or not may not be relevant, but as I say, it's a it's a nice story. Um, this is an oversimplification. Of course, the solar system is also a bit more tilted and distorted than you see here, but uh, it's, a, it's a true thing that from Tea Garden Star's planets, you can see the transits of the solar system and Earth is entering the transit range in a, in a couple of years, which I find super cool, um, even if it's not scientifically too relevant, but who knows who's discovering us in a couple of decades. Okay, uh, let's move on to other science. So I, I just can skim here through a couple of other science cases that we've worked on with Carmenis data. We've been working on stellar parameters, stellar science, and lots of planetary atmospheres, of course. Uh, we've been working on methodology and also on, on uh, looking into known planets and uh, improving, uh, improving parameters. And then there's a big, uh, this big topic of stellar activity and stellar rotation. And from, from those, I will, I will just highlight a few things uh, that I find relevant. First, there's of course planetary atmospheres. So we are working on planetary atmospheres and this is actually working a lot better than, than what we expected. So um, particularly the near infrared arm has become a major machine for planetary atmosphere investigation. And here you can see the results from two papers that appeared back to back in the same issue of science uh, in 2018, 
um, that were reporting the discovery of an extended helium atmosphere around two different planets. And both, both results were produced with Carmenis data. The WASP-69b, the left-hand side result, was done by our group, uh, led by Lisa Nordmann. And the other group um, was using Carmenis during uh, open time proposals. So they asked, there's also some time uh, that, that is available for, uh, for proposals and uh, HET P11 was observed and there was also an extended atmosphere discovered. And this, these two were the first ground-based discoveries of extended atmospheres uh, around exoplanets. And um, at the same time, so in that paper, we also included the discovery of helium in HD 189733B. Um, and then here in this, in this plot here, we could actually do some, some small number of statistics where we relate the activity of the star in our in units of calcium activity or in x-ray flux actually in x-ray flux on the planet but okay so this is sort of the amount of of, uh, of high energy flux that the planet gets to the scale height of the helium extended atmosphere and you can see and what we deduce from that the, is uh, the, the idea here is that um, the presence of an extended helium atmosphere is not so much uh, driven by the planetary, par planetary parameters themselves, but more by the high energy flux that the planets receive, that is actually driving that helium evaporation. And um, this, is, this is why we observe it in the, in the planets that are orbiting active stars, and not so much in the planets that are orbiting inactive stars. For example, before this work, the prediction for GJ436b were that it should be easily detectable uh, but it was not, uh, we couldn't see it. And um, our explanation for that, or, or our proposal is that the star is just not so active and it's not driving that, that um, extension of the helium atmosphere. And there's, there's a number of other papers that I only show here uh, in, in one scheme. There's, for example, discovery of H alpha and water uh, in, in different stars, kelp 9 b and also um, the, the other usual suspects. There's, um, there's a paper that is questioning the discovery of sodium in HD 209-458. Uh, that is also very interesting. Um, so this, this investigation or this, this, uh, yeah, this kind of, of research has become very, a very important science part for our team um, because it, it, it simply works a lot better than, than we thought. So we are able to uh, use the, the methodology that are methodologies that are being developed by many, many groups around the world uh, with Carmenis in a, in a very good way. And um, so very interesting results come out here. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll not go into any of the details here because I, I really have to move on. Oh, yes. So um, there's activity. There's a lot of activity that we work on. And this is sort of my, my own field of, of scientific interest um, very much. Um, Here's an example of the different activity indicators that are scattered throughout the, spect throughout the spectral range of the two Carmenis instruments. For example, EV LUC is a very active M dwarf. It shows variable H alpha emission, uh, and you can see the shape and analyze the shape of this line um, very easily. You see sodium emission, helium emission. This is helium 58876. Um, and then there's helium 10 30 the one where we discovered the planetary emission. Of course, the star also does its thing here, which is relevant. And we even see Pashan beta um, emission here. Very noisy, of course, uh, but it's uh, detected. So we have lots of information on, on activity um, that can be investigated. And one particular point about the activity is, is very interesting. And that is the radial velocity signal of a transiting spot, sort of. If the stars have spots and on the sun, we know that the sun is spots that are cool in temperature, you can sort of think about what is happening to the radial velocity curve if a spot is rotating in front of the star. And what it does, is it produces some signal in the spectral line because there's some flux missing because it's cool here. And if you fit a Gaussian to that, or if you measure the barycenter of these lines and you say, this is my, my, my radial velocity at that point, you can see that here as a function of spottedness, you see some radial velocity distortion. And this is the signal that you get when a spot comes across, right? And this K is the semi amplitude of the signal. And this signal you can confuse with the presence of a planet 
if if you had no other information. Um, and the question is whether this is an effect at every wavelength. And uh, there, are, I've been I've been modeling this effect ten years ago, um, in a in a sort of semi-realistic setup uh, with spectra for these M dwarfs. And these are the predictions for the radial velocity amplitude for stars of different V sine i's here as a function of wavelength. And you can see that in this range here, 700 to 900 nanometers, there's a steep gradient. It doesn't go away. So even if you go to longer wavelengths, it's not really going to zero. But there's a steep gradient here. And this is what you can hope to detect. And this is actually what we see in a few stars. So this, this prediction has been confirmed by observations in a few stars. This is an example of one star where this is one measurement. The radial velocity depends on the wavelength. The radial velocity of that particular observation that is shown here depends on wavelength. And here in a different observation, it also depends on wavelength, but it is going the other way. And then you can work out the amplitude here. How, how large is that K for uh, different wavelengths? And you end up with something that is confirming uh, essentially confirming at least uh, this this gradient here, and this is very interesting and very relevant for our understanding of uh, activity noise, or even of activity uh, of these M dwarfs. I only show you this to to uh, to to show you how nice the spectra are. So these are co-added spectra of uh, of an M dwarf, a very active M dwarf, and you can see the black points are the data points. The Blue dashed line is a model of the spectrum of the stellar photosphere with no magnetic field. And then the, the red fit is what happens if you let Zeeman broadening do its work and you can measure the magnetic field in these lines. So you can very clearly see Zeeman broadening uh, here in this case. And here as a function of rotational period of the stars, we show the uh, magnetic field that you find in all the blue points here are commonest measurements, and then there's lots of other measurements. And uh, I'm so you see that the the, the faster the star rotates, the, the stronger is the field. This is all expected, um, but there's many many measurements of this, and also together with uh, the different symbols from um, from Stokes V polarization measurements that uh, tell you a lot about the geo about the geometry of the of the magnetic field which is not what we can do with Carmenis. We don't have a polarizer. Okay, um, let me come to the last slides. Uh, talking about physics of M dwarfs, this is just an example of how, how well the, how, how much the models of M dwarf atmospheres have improved. So here you can see data and overplotted spectroscopic models, a Phoenix model um, in TIO bands. And for those of you who've worked on M dwarfs for a while, you know that like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, these models were just a mess. They didn't fit at all. And here you can, you can do serious detail spectroscopy with, with this now. You can see that the calcium line here does not fit entirely well. If your screen is large enough and your resolution is high enough, you see a difference between the data and the model. Uh, and in many, but in many other areas, it fits quite well. And also for some particular individual lines here at this wavelength range, you can see that this is really fitting quite nicely. And um, recently uh, we investigated vanadium lines. Vanadium lines have a very strong hyper hyperfine split uh, pattern. And for example, here, um, this is the data. This is one vanadium line. And this is how the vanadium line would look if you don't take into account the hyperfine splitting. This is what most models used to do so far. But if you put it in and if you allow everything, then, then you, you get a very good model. And here you can see the data with the model overplotted with some different uh, scaling of, of the abundance and stuff. So um, this is really a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information in this. And um, finally, uh, what we did from the, from the data is we, we uh, asked the question, where do you want to observe? Or where's the most information if you look at different wavelengths? And here's a rather complicated plot that I, I don't ask you to understand in detail, uh, but I'm happy to talk about a little more. What that shows in different colors is for different stars, different temperatures here, how good an RV measurement can be under given circumstances at a as a function of wavelength, right? 
and you can you can take from this plot from this exercise uh, the empirical information about where you want to look and what kind of star you want to investigate at which wavelengths or taken the other way around if you uh, if you are building if you're asking yourself what kind of spectrograph should i build to investigate a particular star um, this this can help you to find the answer okay um, this is my summary mainly we talked about nearby planets um, the the sweet spot the sweet area for m dwarfs at least down to m7 is 700 to 900 nanometers this is where lots of information is uh, available We've talked about activity, magnetism, stellar parameters, and also about planetary atmospheres. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asgar, for this very broad and very impressive uh, overview of uh, all this result from Kermenes. So if people have comments or questions, you can uh, raise your hand virtually, and I will give you the, the floor. Maybe I can start. There is some question. Somebody want to? No. So I can maybe I can start with one question. Uh, Ansgar, you, uh, you you just presented at the end a comparison of what is expected in, uh, in radial velocity accuracy depending on the wavelength. And so in uh, yes, exactly that one. And so uh, from now from your observation with your both spectrograph in, in, in optical and in uh, infrared, what does the how, how they do compare from actual observation of Carmenes, in particular for the detection of planets. There are many bases of uh, visual spectra, I think, but how, uh, so what could you say to us for the comparison in radial velocity accuracy between both spectrographs as a function of the spectral type of the stars? Um, yeah, you can, you can see, so the, the cut sort of the, the, the cut between different different uh, spectrographs is sort of here, right, at 960 nanometers. So usually these, these are your infrared instruments. And on the left-hand side, these are your, uh, this, this range here, sort of the red optical. And then HARPS is left of, of this line here to here. And what you can, what you see here um, is, for example, if we take an, an early M star here, 3,700 Kelvin, these are the these are the the, the line the, the the points here that are relevant. The the number itself is not relevant, right? That scales with exposure time and how close the star is and whatever. This is there's okay. a there's a fixed signal to noise in the V band and whether this is actually possible for for the for most of the objects, it's not possible to reach this photon noise, right? So don't get distracted here. It's just put on the same scale to make it comparable. So um, here it's it's clear that this this bin here is by far the best. 700 nanometers. There is by far most of the information convolved with the amount of photons that you get for an early M dwarf. Now, if you go to a 3200 Kelvin, then you sort of move to the right, and then if you if you really get cool, 2500 Kelvin. This is this is almost an L dwarf. This is where you want to go infrared, really. And um, actually, I think I have. This this backup slide here. This is a ratio of of different things for for the more interested people. Um, so we we investigated three different instruments. One is a BVR instrument that is a harps like instrument, the band's BVR YZ. This is and this is the infrared instrument, and then RIZ is the red optical. So this you can say sort of harps is BVR, then Carmen is VIS, is RIZ, and YJHK is, is um, Carmen is near. And this is the ratio. So if, if, for example, we look at the, if, for example, we look at the blue curve here, this answers the question, where do you want to observe a star at any given temperature? If you have a Harps-like instrument or a Carmen is uh, this instrument and then you always want to go longer so Carmen is this sort of winds down to like 4000k and then harps is better so if you are below one the shorter wavelengths are preferred and if you for example here compare Carmen is this with Carmen is near that's the red curve you see that okay that that only takes over short of or at cooler temperatures at than 3000 Kelvin so very well, very, very much down here. 
And, and in terms of factual detection, you presented some uh, very challenging detection of planets, even around the uh, let uh, and dwarf, around the cold uh, stars. Actually, on your true data, you, the, the infrared data were really useful for the, for the detections, or it was mainly based on the optical, uh, of the optical uh, spectrograph? For a number of reasons, the RV detections almost exclusively worked on from from the VIS channel. So the near infrared channel. So let, let me go back to the to this to the slide here. Mm, here, so you can see that. So for example, let's say thirty two hundred Kelvin. That's already M four five or so, right? Mm -hmm. There is there is very little information that you get here. Um, in in comparison to this to these two wavelength bands, so if you have 700 and 800 nanometers, that's that's where you get your your precision, and this is where we have most of our stars. So we are our sample is not very much going down. I think I have this <laughs> here. Our sample is focusing on these kind of mid M dwarf types. Uh, here's our sample. So um, right, so at M5 we are sort of cutting off, right? There are very few stars here, simply because a 3.6 meter telescope is too small to do this at any wavelengths at this precision. So you, you really want to do it eight meters in this case. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lessons we learned is if you have a four meter class telescope, um, the most efficient thing to do to find planets is uh, to go for mid M dwarfs uh, and then with a, with a 700 to 900 meter nanometer um, um, instrument. You can, of course, if you go to M7, M8, M9, it makes a lot of sense to go to infrared, but you will not get down to one meter per second, which may not be your goal, right? Because these stars are so light that there's still a lot of information and there's still a lot you can do. Uh, there's this paper here that I've shown that where we also use the near infrared data, uh, but this is actually, you can, you can see here, I can think here, you can see the comparison in this case. Yeah. This is a, a mid M, early M dwarf. And you can really see how much better the, the this channel produces RBs. Okay, thank you. So there are questions by Jean-Philippe Beaulieu and Jean-Pierre Maillard. So first, uh, Jean-Philippe. Okay, I just wanted to comment a bit more about uh, your new planet is 486. So I just did a bit of homework and had a look. And indeed, it is an absolute perfect target for uh, atmosphere probing. Uh, so from the paper, the radius is 1.3 Earth radii. K magnitude of 6.3. So this is very, very bright. So the, and it is a slightly above the mass radius radiation that you have for uh, uh, pure telluric planets. So likely it has an atmosphere. So it puts it really, as I would say, as of today, the best target uh, for the low mass planet atmospheres. Just with a quick look, uh, anything else? Yeah, th th thank you very much for helping me here with the, with the parameters. Um, we've been struggling with the press and I'm, I'm confusing all the numbers these days. So um, yeah, this is, I mean, this is why science bought it. Usually you would say, okay, it's, it's yet another planet and there have been lots of tests, uh, discoveries uh, with radio velocity follow-ups. So it doesn't make it into science in this case. But as you say, the top, the, the thing here is that it's really the top candidate. But it's uh, much, much brighter than the Trappist one. It's five magnitudes brighter, so it's yeah. really perfect. Right, right. Yeah, clearly, it's a very interesting system. Yes. Jean-Pierre. Yes, <clears throat> speaking about activity, so as far as I know, so M dwarf can be subject to very sudden, uh, so mass loss, you know, which could be very dramatic for the atmosphere of a, of a planet. Do you observe such, such kind of a, you know, that means so the star can be quiet and suddenly very a flash of and that is known. So, do you observe such such a phenomenon? Uh, yes. To to just just first come back to to um, to this to this point here. Um, M dwarf. The, the, the general term M dwarfs is very broad, and um, the early M dwarfs are not so super spectacularly active usually and the later ones are. Nevertheless, all of them uh, show flares um, and the more active ones, so the, the ones that usually show H alpha all the time, flare more frequently than the others. And yes, we see lots of flares in our data. And, uh, but of course, um, if we do like flare analysis, if we ask ourselves how, many, how, how often does the star produce a flare, 
uh, test data is just perfect, right? You see all the flares and test data um, much better than, than, than we could ever do it. Uh, but yes, also in our snapshots, uh, we sometimes see, and I think I, I have this plot here. I can, I can just show this again. These are all different flares here, right? So, um, because this kind of phenomenon can really erase the, 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 the atmosphere, so as it could be for the detection of a, <coughs> a molecule, something like that, so that can be very dramatic. Yes, this this could mean that um, this this strong energy flux or this strong wind or whatever from the stars is actually eroding any any uh, atmosphere of the planets. And this is actually one of the questions in Gliese 486 now. So because the gravity of this planet is a lot higher than on Earth, <coughs> you could make the argument that maybe it has actually kept its atmosphere because gravity is so high. But you could also say, okay, uh, the, the star, by the way, is very, very inactive. Rotation period is 130 days. And um, so it, it does flare very, very rarely. Nevertheless, it does. And in its youth, it certainly did. And if the star, if the planet was at the position where it is now uh, in the, during the young times of the star, there, there was certainly the threat that the activity blow, blew away the atmosphere of the planet. And this is one of, the th one of the points why it's so exciting now to look whether this planet has an atmosphere or not. I would, I don't know, if, if, I, if I had to bet some money on it, I would say probably we won't find it. It, it may not be there. Um, but uh, this is this is uh, this is a, a big question now, and one of the rare planets where this observation is going to be possible at high significance. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Edir Martioli. Yes, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, the atmospheric detection with Carmenes is uh, uh, performing better than you expected. Uh, so, uh, my question is: Is there uh, any plan? Uh, survey to detect, to continue this work uh, on, on a sample of uh, transiting planets um, uh, to, to, to apply this technique. And another question is, uh, have anyone tried, has anyone tried to detect the emission uh, from eclipses uh, other than transits? Uh, yes, so for, for the survey, um, one, one thing that we are particularly interested in is this helium survey, right? So we can do this helium analysis very well. Um, and yes, we are looking into as many transits, as many planets as possible to find out whether they have a helium atmosphere or not, and to populate this, this little um, diagram that I've shown you, this one. Right, so this, we, are, we are working on that, and we are certainly trying to get as many transit observations as possible in, in stars where it's useful. The situation is, is, is that, I mean, every discovery, every detection investigation of any species in any planet is, is a big project, right? It's, it's complicated. So there's way more to do than, than we could ever uh, rapidly produce. And so, yes, th this is definitely going on and, and very interesting. And for the emission, um, this is certainly also something that we look into. And of course, emission spectroscopy is one of the one of the things that are really important and interesting. Um, for that, I suppose Carmen is, is is not super sensitive because it's not it's not a ten meter, right? So um, this is science that you want to carry out perhaps with another instrument. But certainly, we we do have uh, eclipse observations as well, and we are looking into this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? Yes, Martina Widner, please. Um, yes, hello. Thank you for the talk. Very interesting. I'm impressed how many planets and stars you could detect. If you wanted to now look for a planet which might have life, would you look for planets around M dwarfs? And if yes, how would you look for them? Would you look in transit spectroscopy or imaging? And what way? Free choice. And so what, what exactly is your question? So uh, are you asking how to look for life or are you asking how to sort of come closer or, or to, to learn more about, about what happened in the, in the history of, of uh, I don't know, planet formation and, and development of life? Because, uh, yeah. I, I'd like to find in the end planets for 
uh, which might have like, well, okay, I'll give you another hint. I'm thinking a little bit, I know that for the decadal survey in the US, they've proposed two missions. One is HabEx, which is more looking at imaging planets in the near infrared and optical. And then there's another mission called Origins, where they want to look for planets by looking at transit spectroscopy in the mid infrared. And I just wanted to see a little bit, but maybe there's other things which I'm not aware of, but I wanted to hear a little bit from somebody who's probably neither one, what you would recommend. Yeah, I, I, I don't have any good recommendations how to find life, uh, certainly, because I mean, this, this is the big question. And um, so far, nobody has really produced any tracer that could um, unambiguously say or, or produce information, pr produce significant signs that there is any life. So you would, you would definitely want to look for some, some molecules in non-equilibrium in the atmospheres of a planet. That is probably what people want to do. And I mean, our part in this, in this quest is to look for Earth-like terrestrial planets, let's put it that way, terrestrial planets, solid surface that are within the liquid water habitable zones, right? Because we still guess that liquid water is, is what is necessary for life. So um, finding these planets in the liquid water habitable zone uh, is, is the way to go. And then, yeah, investigate those atmospheres and look for, for signatures of non-equilibrium um, molecules, uh, molecules in a non-equilibrium state. And um, I, I suppose that this is, or I know that this is, this is of course what all the missions that you mentioned on the long run uh, are looking for. Um, I'm, I'm personally, like I think many others, are, I, I'm not convinced we should narrow this search at any point, right? So to, to of course, it, it would be good to have a shortcut and to find something but so far, I could not be convinced that there is any such thing as as a as a uh, unambiguous tracer of life. So this kind of quick success uh, is not really uh, on the horizon, I suppose. And that's why we need to to uh, to attack this this question from from different ways, including, for example, the question whether the habitable zone is actually a concept that makes any sense, whether we should actually narrow down our search for this, right? I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I suppose um, I'm sort yeah, of... said we should yeah. not limit to one, but we should try to pursue all of them. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other question or comment? Apparently not. So I propose we stop here. So uh, thank you uh, again, Ansgar, and uh, everybody at IAP. Let's. Ah, no, another question. Alain, no, okay, no, just uh, I was applauding. Ah, sorry. <laughs> thank you, Ansgar, and so uh, you. everybody at IAP. See you next week for the next uh, IAP seminar. <laughs>